Well, should we kick things off for about a minute after? Um, there's a little bit of housekeeping. Carly, I, uh, my understanding is that um, there are two um, spots where people can can ask questions. One is a Q and A, and the other is in is in chat. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. So please feel free to uh, to um, to ask questions, and we'll do our best to answer them uh, as we go along. And certainly, no problem with interruptions if uh, if you if there's a question that we should answer in the flow of the conversation, then we're happy to do so. But if it's something we can wait till the end, then that's cool too. But feel free to enter those questions in. Okay, so we'll kick things off today. We're gonna to talk about strategies for effective remote compliance training, specifically taking a, a game-based approach. Um, and um, we, we, our company, Lemonade LXP, which is a learning experience platform that's built specifically for financial institutions, we've partnered um, with RBCCL, a compliance consultancy, um, to create um, a series of game-based courses um, to help with remote compliance training. And so we'll talk a little bit about those today, but I wanted to start by talking about um, remote working and, and, and sort of where things are, are headed. So, you know, in the UK pre-pandemic, you had about 5% uh, of the workforce worked at home. Um, but now 71% of managers say that um, they think remote working is really uh, their organization's future. And 33% of, of leaders are considering a permanent remote uh, working in the post-pandemic world. And so um, that change is happening fast. And certainly during the pandemic, um, companies have had to make some pretty significant adjustments from the, from the standpoint of technology and getting people set up um, and making sure that they have the right tools and collaboration tools and softwares and so forth. But a lot, a lot of that work is done. So, um, it stands to reason that a good number of companies probably won't go back to the office or um, will have certain chunks of their workforce remain remote um, because there's big advantages, um, lots of cost savings for both the companies and the employees, environmental savings as we were chatting, if you happen to be on before we started. So uh, a lot of advantages. And so looks like that's going to be a trend moving forward. So, um, with a remote workforce, um, compliance training um, encounters some new challenges. Um, I think compliance training has typically um, not been among employees' favorite activities um, in, a, in a given week. Um, so the first challenge is driving that initial participation. Um, and that what you need to do there is overcome employee apathy towards compliance training. Um, in our conversations with employees at financial institutions, there's often um, uh, 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 conversations about compliance training aren't met with the most enthusiastic responses. So I think overcoming that apathy is going to be a challenge. Um, there's also competing with the distractions of the at-home workforce. So unlike at the office at home, there's, a, there's an awful lot of things that could be tugging at your sleeves, any, anything from your kids to your pets to Netflix to your fridge. Um, there is a no, there's a number of things that can distract folks. So I think we're really going to have to up our game where it comes to training uh, to make sure that people are willing to participate um, and that we overcome the apathy and then we keep them engaged. So then once we've done all that, which um, isn't an easy challenge, there's the challenge of making it stick. How do we ensure that um, people aren't just reading a piece of content and ticking a box and saying they're done? Um, and so I think those are some of the big challenges um, that we're going to face with remote compliance training. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, some of the um, advantages of a game-based approach. Um, when talking about this, um, the apathy and getting people involved, a game-based approach can be really magnetic. Um, we can um, reach out to folks um, via email and challenge them to participate uh, in a game-based approach. And so I think um, th that can be one of the, with the big advantages. Also, it's fundamentally delivered in a micro learning format. So you learn in small chunks of distributed practice, instead of trying to absorb a whole bunch of content in one setting, one sitting, you actually get to take it over and over again and drive that repetitive practice that's required. Um, the game based approach is extremely engaging and interactive and, and Rob's going to show you that a little bit later. Um, but I think part of the interactive is that 
you're constantly asked for information and then you're given feedback and you kind of learn through your mistakes. I think that's a big advantage. Also, you can get very in-depth tracking, which uh, is important for a reporting standpoint and making sure that you've, uh, that you've shored up any risks that you have. And, and ultimately, I think what you can get is better learning outcomes a little bit faster. So that's kind of the advantage of the game-based approach. I wanted to just take a second to highlight the difference between gamification, which is a, a buzzword, and uh, um, we, we actually around the office call it lamification um, because we don't think it's the best way to train, and, game, and a game-based approach, which is different. So gamification is really the application of typical elements to a non-game activity. So in the training, from a training perspective, it would be um, taking, for example, your learning content, let's say it's a PDF, a video, whatever you've produced, and then saying that once I've read the PDF, I get a badge, uh, read five PDFs and I get on the leaderboard. The challenge there is that the learning experience, the content itself, didn't change. Uh, I'm still just reading a piece of content or passively watching a video. And uh, um, so the rewards that I get, points and badges, um, they also don't have any context other than just sort of a, a virtual reward for having done something. So I think um, the gamification tactic will have a short term effect on participation, um, but it won't last because without context to the points and, and, and leaderboards and stuff, they don't really mean much. And because the uh, exp learning experience hasn't changed and hasn't improved, employees will eventually settle back and go, okay, it's the same old thing with uh, points, and, uh, points and badges. Uh, so I don't think that will be the most effective way. But a game-based approach is fundamentally different because what you're doing is you're taking your content and morphing it into a game so that people learn through play. And I think that is the, the real fundamental difference. It's more interactive. The actual content itself elicits input from, from the learner and then provides feedback um, and it, in the form of uh, validation that they were right or mistakes that forced them to uh, take the challenge again. And I think that's a fundamental difference in, in the two ways of training. So now I'm gonna hand it over to Rob, who's, who's gonna um, do a walkthrough of some of the content that we've collaborated on to, to, uh, to, to game up compliance training and make it a little bit more engaging. And th thanks to Rob and, and his team for their expertise uh, on how to, how to get that content in the format. So he's gonna show you what, what we've done together. So I'll just uh, stop sharing my screen here. Thanks very much, John. Thank you. I'll just before I show you the platform, everyone, I'll just give a kind of quick, quick introduction to myself and my company, uh, RBCCL, or RB Compliance Consultancy, uh, just to give you a little bit, a little bit of background. So I'm I'm Robert Robert Bell, uh, owner of RB Compliance Consultancy. Uh, my background is in law and then uh, in compliance in, in financial services. It's just where I ended up. Um, uh, but I actually genuinely uh, enjoy working working in the arena. But I was working in-house for, uh, for a few years. And then uh, following that, I've set up my, my consultancy firm. And we've been running since 2012, doing all the typical stuff that you get from a compliance consultancy, a lot of third line auditing, advice, policy creation, FCA application. But we've actually um, ended up with maybe 60 to 70% of our work being training or, or learning and, and development, which I actually much prefer. I really enjoy, I think it's a much nicer day than writing, I don't know, a data retention policy for someone. I think it's so much nicer to, uh, to share knowledge and share your experience and see other people developing. Um, but I think as, as, as John alluded to before, typically when you've got your compliance, say day of training, whether it's induction or refresher training, or you've got uh, your, your, your compliance e-learning to do, you see people's heart sink a, a little bit. And, and all, my ethos for a long time and our ethos at RB Compliance has, has been to, to, to make the compliance training the, the most fun. So it should be the funnest day, the most interesting day of all of their, of all of their training. And that's when uh, 
when uh, John and I connected and, and, and I learned a little bit about this, this Lemonade platform, um, I just thought it's absolutely perfect uh, to meet that goal of making the, the compliance training the kind of most enjoyable element of it. And what I particularly like, I think the key takeaways from, from what we said before, is the fact that it's not really one point in time that you, that you do the training. So, you know, typically you might have, you know, a, an hour a month or two hours a month where you do a, a module for your compliance refresher training. Instead, the concept of this is micro learning. So they're coming in out of the system uh, as, as much as they need and as much as you allow. And John will explain later, you, they can, we can play some limits because uh, we don't want people to play it too much as well. Um, but people can come in and out of the system. They can play the same subjects, the same games time and time again. And they give it a go, multiple choice, that sort of thing, uh, which I'll show you in a moment. And then they, they, they see what, what went well, see what they got right, what they didn't. And, and that's how, that's how they, they learn. And I think that's a really fantastic new way to get across uh, compliance training. Um, so really the, the ethos is it's addictive, that they come back. Um, so, for example, um, they can have the system open in the background, say if they're in the call centre environment between calls, there's no customers to speak to instead of chatting to colleagues, uh, they, might, they might pop onto the system, play, play a couple of games, oh, I've got a call, they can stop halfway through, that's fine, and, and, and connect with a call. So it can really be built into the kind of dead time, if you like, that they have through the day. Um, or you can, you can put the kind of energiser 10 minutes, once a day, twice a day, whatever you preferred. Um, or however often to, to let them focus on it. And we also see people using the system quite a lot during their travel, uh, to and from work or at lunch or whatever, which is great, you know, which is great using, using their own times. And of course, firms can incentivize people, people coming back to the system, as well as it being fun in itself, you can incentivize it through appraisals, one-to-one, -one, linking their performance, uh, to uh, wage rises, bonus payments, whatever you like. And there's a few different ways you can do that. So for example, you can do it across their scores. So if they hit a certain percentage as an average or per module, then, then, then that might be your target. Or we have a leaderboard. So say everyone in your company, uh, there's a leaderboard of who's, who's got through the game the most. Um, and those at the top, you know, might get, uh, might get a, a better better score their appraisal or their one-to-one. -one. So there's, there's plenty of different ways, which when you see the analytics section, which is really, really great in this platform, you'll see, see how that kind of uh, can, can pull together. So let's have a little look and show you what this looks like. So hopefully everyone can see my screen now. Um, and this essentially is the game, okay? so. Somebody logs on and they see this main this main screen, okay? And this is a little bit like maybe other games you've, you've played, might have played in the, in the past where you kind of start with, say, a small town, uh, really rural, and then you need to build it up into a metropolis. It's the same idea, but in this case, we're, we're building a financial services institution and, and we picked a bank uh, because that's something all of your, all the uh, team members will, will be aware of how banks work and they can really relate to it quite well. So you start with uh, this screen, which is a very basic financial services firm. And over time, you need to build it into a huge, huge banking organization, yeah, multinational uh, in, in the city or, or wherever. So how do you build it? Well, you can see you've got these six kind of squares around where you might spend some of the, the points that you have, okay? So you'll see at the top, you've got rank, clients and points. Ranks where you are in your leadership, um, in your leaderboard, sorry. So if you have 30 people uh, um, in your company that's, that's using this training, you'll be one to 30. Clients are the number of customers that, that your bank has. And of course, the more customers, the more money they deposit with you, and that's points. See, points is money the money goes up, points goes up, as people uh, deposit it and you invest that money, etc. So you use the points, the money to improve your banking organization. Yeah, so you can click on to uh, HQ like we did in this time and you might think, actually, I'll, I'll add a Twitter chat bot and um, that's 100,000. 
Um, if you wanted to use Alexa or, or Google Home Voice Chatbot, that would be more points, and so on and so forth. And you can choose lots of different ways to improve uh, your HQ. This actually in itself, in terms of choosing what add-ons uh, you, you put onto your organization, that in itself is a form of learning because then your, your team members are understanding all of the elements, and we've made this really realistic, but all of the elements that you would use to build up any large uh, financial services firm. Um, so that actually in itself, without really realizing it, is, uh, is, is a form of learning. So for example, you can add to your branch, you can add uh, cash points, you can add different form channels in, you can improve your internet, and you can use the technology side of things. As well, so there's a whole host of different uh, uh, different additions to to build your branches to improve them. But of course, you need money to do that, and to get money, you need clients. How do you get clients? Well, you click on the big play now button, and here you have a range of different courses or modules, whatever you wanted to call them. So um, I'll just flick through them all, so you can have a good kind of overview of, of the range of some 30 different modules that were built from things such as uh, introduction to the FCA, you put your GDPR and um, principles and rights as part of GDPR, you've got consumer credit rules, you've got vulnerable customers, you've got some the, the more soft skills side of things as well, so uh, dealing with difficult situations for example, um, treating customers fairly, conduct rules training as well. So we've got a kind of introduction to what SMNCR is, but you've also got the conduct rules training, which you know is a requirement from the FCA to, to do this training. And um, so this meets what is required uh, of the FCA, which is fantastic. Um, through the complaints handling, we've broken that down into a few different sections, and um, some more around things like consumer credit rules, uh, financial difficulties. So you can see we've got a real range uh, of different courses. The typical compliance modules, I think you would, you would expect to see. But there's, I want at this stage just to, to let you know, there's two approaches we can have, okay? So this is kind of the off the shelf, if you like, the basic starting point. Um, and if somebody wanted, you know, if, you, if this was ideal for you, you can have off the shelf, great setup costs are then really low. And uh, and we can we can get your users in and start using start using this version of it, or we can make together a more bespoke version, where obviously there'll be some setup costs with that to understand what what you want trains, whether that's your system, and um, whether that's key procedures for you. If you were an insurance firm, you know, consumer credit rules wouldn't be so useful, but uh, but ICOPS, yeah, insurance contract of business would be would be what you, the area you'd want to focus on. Uh, for example, and um, so we can we can mold it to what you need, um, and we'll work that out together, um, um, depending on depending on on how much time, effort, work there is to do that. But we're really flexible uh, around how we would go about doing that. And um, so yeah, two options: this off the shelf, uh, we, where we can plug you in nice and quick, or we can develop a few modules together. But the good stuff is, I think most of these modules would be the same, and. Uh, um, so, so I think most of the legwork is done. So what we're going to look at today, so the user would then click into whichever module they want to take. The one we're going to look at today is mix up. So this is our kind of uh, demonstration version, if you like, to, to give an idea of, uh, of, of uh, the different types of games that people would then play. So each course has a number of steps. The number of steps is radically different. So depending on the course. So some courses have 10 to 15, some courses have two or three, depending on how in-depth they need to be. Each step is an activity you do, and each one uh, is done in, in a different way. So again, it's nice and entertaining, nice and different, and this is the real game-based approach. So whether it's true or false, whether it's scenarios, which are kind of conversations in which the, the end user can choose uh, different responses, and that puts it down a different path in the conversation. So very real life for a lot of particularly frontline agents. And uh, so you've got the conversations, you've got multiple choice, um, you've got a, what we'll call a polygraph, which is a statement where there's some incorrect words put in just to make sure that they are reading it and they have to identify the incorrect words. So a um, whole host of different different ways to learn videos as well, uh, which we've, we've built some kind of animated videos and put them in too. And 
the the uh, player and um, the learner will get a different number of clients depending upon how, a how difficult this step is and B, how well they perform. So if they answer everything spot on, everything perfectly, they'll get the maximum number they could in that step. If they, if they don't perform so well, they only get 50%, then, then they won't get as, as many. And actually they can they can lose clients as well if they have a poor performance. So, so it keeps them on their toes a little bit too. Uh, so that's an important part. So let's have a look at the role of the FC. And this is what we call streak. So there's always a little bit of an introduction uh, telling telling the learner what they will learn, uh, and then they can on this screen again we'll have that introduction, but it also tells them how many clients they can earn. So this is quite light work, quite easy. So they can earn six clients. So let's play. So there's some questions, um, and they've got to answer them, and that gets them up the streak. Um, so for example. Uh, the FCA's main rule book is called. I think you'll find it's the FCA handbook. Good. And that's supported by a little bit of information at the bottom. If they get it wrong, um, again, they get that feedback. So the next time they come in, they, um, they can get it right. Um, is it poor conduct to give clear information to a customer? No, it sounds kind of the right thing to do for me. So you press no, and it tells them whether they're correct or not. So this is essentially this game. You'll notice in the top right corner of the screen, there are some, some hearts. They, they are uh, depicting lives. So if they get five incorrect answers, they lose all of their lives. Um, so obviously the answer to this one is financial services industry. Um, but if you put accountants as a wrong answer, you'll see they lose a life. Um, and it tells them a little bit of, uh, about the FCA. So I'll not go through all the questions because I think you probably get the idea of this particular uh, game, this particular step. So that's essentially uh, one of the ways that they can learn. So that's that's what we call streak. Another one is uh, we'll, we'll look at what is vulnerability. So obviously a key key area. Um, so in this section, we'll get an understanding of what vulnerability is and the different types. Of vulnerability and using true or false. So again, it's kind of uh, you, 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 like you know, kind of classic true or false kind of learning, but it's done in a really fun way. So a, per a person with learning difficulties could be vulnerable. Is is that true? Yeah, absolutely. A vulnerable customer, maybe someone who has a mental health condition, will get this one incorrect on purpose. Not quite, and. Uh, there's a bit more information so that next time when they come in, they can get it right. You've got the good old true and false side of things as well. So let's have a look at some more games for you. This one's particularly neat. So in our vulnerability sections, we, we go through some basic information. What is vulnerability? You know, the types of vulnerability. How do you identify it? And then they can put it into practice a little bit. We also teach the idea protocol, the Texas protocol. And then this uh, scenario is a chance for them to put it into practice. So this takes deep thought. So there's more clients that can be gained from, from doing this. So this is a customer contacting a firm. Um, so I'm pulling about the letter you sent, or I think it must have been weeks ago now. And the, 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 the player gets to choose a reply. To begin with, to get them in, I, I just like to give them kind of one reply, and then they start getting a bit of a choice which puts them down different paths with how the conversation might go. And I always like to think about the kind of data protection element as well of things. Um, so, so we always have they need to do the security questions. So they're helping the customer um, with uh, with where, where that information is. And you see the time bar running down at the bottom because they've got to answer quite quickly, a bit like they would do in a real conversation. So this is where they have two choices. We think this one might be better. So if you click this choice, you get an extra point. You click the other choice, it's not as good. Um, so they don't get points. The conversation carries on, but they have a chance to um, have a chance to, to redeem themselves and bring it back to where they should need to be. 
So again, you can see there are lots of different, different choices. And this particular conversation takes them through needing to identify vulnerability, use texts to get explicit consent, explain how they're going to, um, going to use the data, um, an idea to find out a little bit more um, about how it affects that individual as well. Okay, so in essence, this is a great way for a person to practice what they've learned about vulnerability in a real life, um, real life conversation, if you like. So we'll have a look at GDPR MythBuster. There's a lot of myths about GDPR, a lot of things you hear in the uh, in the media. So we like to try and challenge that. Really helps agents, especially and, and correspondence analysts, be really confident when they're speaking to customers, and um, because they get a bit more confidence about whether they're right or wrong. Uh, with you know, with the customer saying kind of talking about their right to be forgotten, and they can kind of respond to that knowing that they are they're right. Yeah. So which of the following is true? And uh, when getting consent, we can pre-tick a box. So that's not right anymore. And then they submit their answer. There we go. So correct needs, uh, consent needs to be informed, unambiguous and from an action. And um, data subjects no longer have the right to access a copy. I don't think that's right. So they can now get uh, uh, the right to access, but free of charge. So which two best describe when you can process data? You can only process data with the consent because that's one of the myths that people say, oh, now under GDPR, you always need consent. Not true. You can use vital interests, yeah, if it's to, to keep somebody or somebody else alive. Um, or where there's a contract with the individual, like mortgage, insurance, loan, um, but only where that data is necessary. So I think that's probably right. Great, so we're getting rid of that consent myth. Yeah. Which is true, you can process special category data with consent for legal claims or to help the economic well-being, or you need consent to process special category. Another myth with GDPR is that people assume that you, the only reason you can process special category data, healthcare data, for example, is with explicit consent. Not correct in Article 9, uh, of GDPR uh, section 2A to G and there's a lot of different reasons and uh, and they spill over into um, uh, into the Data Protection Act 2018 uh, which include things like economic well-being and I'm actually writing uh, guidance um, on behalf of Money Advice Trust at the moment uh, around that area um, uh, at the moment too so one thing I'm with, with the other work that I do in consultancy you can you can be assured that the latest compliance rules, uh, the latest version of these of, of elements in the FCA handbook and latest elements of GDPR are, uh, are, are in this training. So it's very much up to date. So I think you get the idea of how, how this applies. Um, so yeah, um, lots of different ways, lots of different methods that we can use. And I'll just very quickly show you the polygraph that I mentioned before. So this is quite nifty. This is a good one to make sure that, that people do read uh, the pieces of, uh, of information in front of them. Quite nice when you want to get a kind of definition across um, to, to, to the user. Um, because they have to basically read this and identify any of the words they think is are not correct in there. Yeah. So whichever ones you would think you might click and then it would tell you whether it's right or wrong. So I think that it's a really good additional useful useful way. So yeah, um, there in essence is 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 the platform. Uh, you can see it's the trainings across in lots of different games, lots of different scenarios. Um, and then ultimately we've got a range of different courses ready to go and you 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 do the you do the the course if you like or the step you gain some clients you then go back to your home you can see now I've gained some clients from from the work that I've done that will that will add um, money and over time and then I can go and I can I can build my organisation my bank um, and and bring it forward as much as I possibly can into the future um so that's the kind of game based element of it the compliance element of it um. 
the next thing of real interest is the analytics. Yeah, so you can see and check how um, how well your your team is progressing, that they are coming in, what and, and using the system, what their scores are, uh, and uh, and what have you. And that's that's a really impressive element of it. So I'm going to hand back to John, and John will uh, take you through that part. Okay, Over to you, right. John. I'm just going to share out my screen again. Uh, make sure that everybody can see. Uh, make sure I'm sharing the right screen here. Mm -hmm. Hold on a sec. Okay, so you should be able to see my uh, my screen. So <clears throat> Lemonade um, has an, a, a fairly deep analytics package. Um, and the first one we're going to look at um, is just the, the, the dashboard, which allows you to see general participation. So qu a quick overview of how your training is doing. So, and it, you can sort by um, organization, by department. Let's say you had multiple departments and you can also sort by date. Um, but the first, the dashboard is basically going to show um, learning moments, which is the number of questions or challenges people have answered in a day. Um, learner visits per day. And then we've got an activity heat map. The darker squares indicate the times of day that people are most likely to participate in the training. So it gives you a sense of when you might want to promote that training. You can start to identify times of day people are most likely to participate in the training and promote it in those times or just leading up to it. Engagement is going to show us the number of steps played in the day and how much time people are spending each day participating. It gets really interesting when we dive into efficacy. Um, you know, as you launch a program, what you'll see here with this graph is you'll see the number of people who haven't started taking their training, the number who are novice, who are intermediate, advanced, and expert. So at the beginning of your um, training program, you'll see you probably have a lot of, um, of dark squares or gray squares, I mean, but as it becomes more mature, it'll turn increasingly green. And when it gets completely green, then people have really mastered your content, which means that uh, you should be, you should have a good um, posture with regard to compliance. Um, Lemonade also, um, I, I think as Rob explained, you know, when you participate in a game and you, and you don't do well, you lose customers in the booster game. And so people will retake that training module over and over to maximize their score, to, mac to maximize their progress in the booster game. But the first couple of times they participate in each module, Lemonade actually tracks those scores. Um, and those are used to form a baseline. And then as they, re as they repeat the modules to master them and progress in the, in the booster game, we take their average score. So then we can pit their average score against their baseline to validate that they are in fact learning. So it's pretty powerful because it can show how much people have improved over time through um, repeating the, the, the modules and that repetition that, that drives, um, drives mastery of something. So that's just a quick dashboard, but you can also go and dig right into your learners and you get some pretty rich information. Here you can see how many days they've played, how much time they've spent learning, how many questions they've answered, how many of those they got correct, what their average score was, what their baseline score was, and their max score was just the best time they performed. But this column shows, it pits their, their um, baseline against their average to show uh, learning. And so you'll see, you'll be able to see um, it, how each employee is performing and how their knowledge is improving through participation. You can then go and dig down into each employee, um, see um, a more detailed graph of exactly how much time they spent training, where they rank in your organization in terms of percentile. And then you can go and look into specifically what courses they've started and, and how many times they've played, how many times they've got it perfect and what their best grade is. So you get a sense of where they're strong and where they're weak. So if you um, can go in and look at individual employees and see, well, you know, they really haven't done this training or that training, it allows you to spot where some of your risks might lie and, and um, give you the opportunity to prod these folks and say, look, you really need to get in there and finish up to these specific modules. So very deep analytics here in Lemonade to help you understand how your training is performing. Another unique thing that the system allows you to do is actually track your courseware. So, you know, it, it, um, the, the canned courseware that um, we've, we've developed with, with Robert, um, you can go and perform and report on each one of those modules. Or if you were to create some bespoke stuff 
um, with with RBC compliance, I think that the, you, you could go and report on those as well. And you can dig into specific courses and you can see the individual steps that have been taken. And then you can see uh, how many times they've been participated in, what the average scores are and the baseline scores. So you can really dig into um, how each course is performing, um, sorry, how each course is performing um, in your compliance training. So let's say, for example, if you took a records management and retention, I could go see there's two, two, two um, modules in there and I can even dig into the modules themselves to see how people are performing in the individual modules. So everything from dashboard all the way to learners and courses, you've got super deep um, analytics to understand how your, how your training is performing, how your people are performing within the training um, and allow you to spot knowledge gaps and areas of risk. So it's pretty deep. Now I'm just gonna pull up my um, screen again, uh, my, my presentation. So I wanted to talk about some of the, the, the results that we're seeing. Um, qualitative results um, from employees, and I think this is the important thing where distance learning is concerned, where we're trying to get people's attention and we're trying to cut through the clutter of, of the day at home. Um, you know, 92% of employees surveyed say they prefer Lemonade to other training. Um, we see about a 25% knowledge increase on average for Lemonade training programs. Um, we get about an 84% voluntary participation rate, which speaks to that, that um, engagement factor in getting people to participate initially. And 88% of employees say they would they want all their other training delivered through Lemonade LXP. So um, I, I think we've we've this this can have really help level up the engagement factor of your compliance training so i think that's where we uh where the where the advantage lies with um with rob's version of, of lemonade and the courseware that he's built in there so that is our presentation is there anything you wanted to add robert no i think i think that's just about everything um i think uh happy to answer any any questions that anyone might have but uh but I guess uh, next steps, if, if you are interested uh, in, in exploring this a bit further, um, contact me. You can see my email address and my telephone number on the screen there. So, so note that down um, give me a call or an email uh, and we can discuss the next steps. You know, if someone is interested in the course, then we would scope out exactly what, what, um, what modules you want to, to be taught as part of your compliance training. So at induction and, and refresher. And, and then and then go from there in terms of how we how we might tweak what we've got build this um and of course quoting for it then as well um but yeah ultimately the the aim is is that you know distance learning um is that it's it's cheaper than than face to face that that's the aim um uh, that's what we're, that's what we're after so we're on the classroom based uh, so so it should be cheaper it should be more flexible and it should uh, it should allow people to to to, work, to learn when they're working from home as well which is great so um so brilliant um if any questions i'm happy happy to hang about and answer otherwise take my details and and let us know when 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 you want to set up uh, that scoping chat are there any questions in there carly uh, so, hi guys. Um, I've been uh, monitoring the chat and the Q&A um, and we've got a couple of questions here. Um, also, I should note if we don't get to your question live, uh, we will email you with an answer afterwards. Also, we are recording this, so if you've tuned in a little bit late, we will be sending out uh, the recording tomorrow. Um, so, uh, one question that I have here, how long would it take to uh, get up and running on Laminate LXP. So, so in essence, the, the, it's ready. Uh, system is ready. Putting in the learners. Um, it's just that the only thing will be is is if you want to use the kind of off the shelf version, that, and that's pretty much you know straight away. If you wanted to to build our own modules, it depends on how many how many you wanted to build. Uh, and uh, yeah, um, so so if you know if there was a you know another thirty, then then would. Uh, you know, have to obviously plan in that way. But if there was maybe one or two, then we can be really, really quick with that. They are super, super easy to build, uh, super quick. So, um, so we can do that, you know, fairly fast. Okay. Um, another question, this might be a John question. 
can, can Lemonade LXP be used for uh, other types of training beyond compliance? Could um, someone say, train someone on how to use uh, their mobile app? Yeah, yeah um, Lemonade has um, all sorts of different modules built, baked into it. And we, you know, we certainly used it for other forms of training in the past. A lot of clients that use it for digital adoption, digital transformation training. Um, some clients use it for HR training. Um, in, in this case, um, the focus was really on bringing, bringing a product to market um, w with um, RB compliance to, to, um, to, to satisfy the compliance training need in distance learning. But if your needs were to go beyond it, we could certainly work something out where we can put other courseware in so that it tackles not just your compliance training, but other training challenges that you've got as you try to engage and train a remote workforce. Okay, and uh, last question here. Um, is there an age group that this kind of training appeals to most? That's a great question. You know, we get that question all the time because the perception is, that people who play games are typically living in their parents' basements. Um, but the truth of the matter is um, there doesn't seem to be like when large implementations that we've done with, with big financial institutions, people from all ages are participating. In the casual game world, it's actually middle-aged women are the most active casual gamers online, um, which is interesting, but it's true. And the candy crushers and so forth. Um, but we found it throughout our implementations that the people from all across the organization participate. Um, and it's not so much indexed to age or gender, um, but rather to people who enjoy uh, gaming, which, you know, if you think about board games and computer games and sports and, you know, there aren't too many people who don't like games. And that's what we find. That's why the 84% participation rate. But no, it's not generally um, exclusive to any specific age bracket or gender. Perfect. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for, for attending. We sure, certainly appreciate it. And if you have any questions, you, you've got Robert's information there. Um, I can attest to that he's quite prompt at getting back to folks. So <laughs> fire him off an email or give him a call and uh, he'll be able to help you out. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks.